Hi, I'm John Colocha from J. Colocha Guitars. Today we're going to talk about soldering. Actually, we're not only going to talk about it, but it's going to be a very long, um, maybe somewhat boring video where we're actually going, actually two, two videos, I think, where we're actually going to build one of these. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. Uh, we're going to build the board. We're going to assemble the box. We're going to see every see every step. Um, we're going to um, talk talk about all the various um, equipment that I that I use. Some some of this is going to be applic applic <laughs> applicable to. Um, to uh, guitar to guitar work, especially the stuff the stuff in the box with the uh, wiring. Um, some of it not so. Um, you know, I had I've had a bunch of people send me emails and ask me about you know what does what does the inside of the box look like? You know, what type of components do you do uh, you use? You know, stuff like stuff like this. And um, I've also had lots and lots of discussions online and with friends and customers um, about how do you actually solder. I've taught a bunch of people how to, how, to, how to solder, how to make really great joints, good, reliable joints. Um, so I figured let's just combine it all and um, let's just see how you build one. Okay? So let's get going. Like I said, I hope... This isn't too, too boring, but um, there are going to be some parts that are a little bit boring. But I enjoy building these. You know, I, I enjoy what I do for a living. And uh, maybe someone out there enjoys watching what I do for a living. You know, especially if you're a, a, man, you're a manager. You know, you like watching other people work. So for you managers out there, you're going you're gonna to love this series. Okay, let's go. <coughs> First, I'm going to ramble a little bit. About some of some of the equipment that I that I have here, I'm not going to leave anything out. Or even or even going to look at pliers. Okay. Let's start with this guy here. This is basically the center of my bench. This pan of ice is great. I love this thing. You can use it for all sorts of different different things. I use I use this building uh, cables. Oh, in fact. We're going to have a little series on building cables too. That'll be the third video in this series. You're going to see how uh, we do that too. Um, you know, those, are, those aren't on my website yet. At least not at not at the time of this uh, filming. But they're going to be there soon. Soon uh, again. I've been, um, you know, it's the type of thing that I sell sell locally, and um, one of these days it make it makes it to the uh, website when. I have a chance. But if you're interested in a cable, uh, you could always just send me an email, john at jcolochaguitars.com, and um, I can let you know what I have uh, before it actually hits the uh, website. But anyhow, this pan of ice is great. You know, we use it to hold boards. Really nice. You don't want to scrunch this down too tight. The board will flex. Um, it would be you really don't want to solder with the board flexed because when the board unflexes, it can break the solder joint. It can lift the trace. It may not even be something that you notice right away. Uh, it might be some be something that breaks ten years from now or two or two years from now or maybe you drop it, and um, that gives just enough added stress to break a trace or lift a pad or break a joint or do or do something like that. So we're, we're going to be kind to these boards just enough to hold to hold it and having these jaws these compliant uh, rubber jaws really really helps uh, they all you know they also make an actual board holder it's a little bit large for what we want to do here um, and I don't think it's as useful May, maybe if you're working with really large boards I happen to have it mounted on the heavy base this is a base that they that they make really nice it's heavy you can move, can move it around there's some holes in it that uh, they actually make things like solder holders that you can screw into here or you can make your own little jigs that will um, will that will screw into here that's 
it's convenient too. I have I have a couple of those if um, if I remember and if I have a chance, maybe I'll show you some. But it's not. It's actually nothing that has any anything to do with um, uh, with guitar electronics. It's for some other stuff that I do here. Okay. Enough about the pan device. Basic tools that you're going to want. You're going to want clippers. Um, these are great. They're Exolite. Let's see. You see that? Um, I, 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 this is basically all I use for, for cutters. These particular ones are fairly new. They're only a few years old. I have some in the other part of my shop, in the guitar building part of my shop, that are 20 years old. And uh, they work great. It's, they cost a little bit more than the Chinese stuff, but these things will last you. Um, if you're a pro, they'll last you a really long time. If you're a hobbyist, they'll easily last you a lifetime as long as you don't abuse them. Okay? So you don't want to use these to cut guitar, guitar strings. Actually, the, the ones I have in the other side of the shop are my, are my old 20-year-old 20, 20 ones that uh, now I use to cut guitar strings. But if you want them to last a long time, use these to cut wire. That's it. Okay. Probably going to want some basic needle nose pliers. These are really cheap. This one, this particular one, is a pros kit one, um, only because they're light. They're really light, and my local ele electronics store happens to um, carry this brand. And I like buying stuff there because I want to keep them in uh, biz. Oh, cables and connectors in Newington, Connecticut. Fantastic. Um, real electronic stores are like what Radio Shack used to used to be. They're really great, really great. I try to give them all the business I can. And these come in real handy too. This is probably so. It's kind of boring stuff there. This is probably something that you've never seen. Uh, you have to know what to ask for. These are called um, chain nose pliers. Chain nose pliers. You can see they're completely round the whole way around. So if we look at these, you can see. Maybe you can. I hope you can. The out, outside's round, but the inside's flat. Okay. If you try to form a bend around this, what you're going to end up with is a sharp bend on the flat part, and then it'll it'll get round over here. But but the inside's going to be sharp. We don't want that. We don't want that. No sharp bends. No nicks. We don't want to nick our wires or our leads or anything else. It causes a stress riser. And one day it's going to break there. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now, who knows? It could break there. So when we're making bends, if we're going to use pliers, I make, I make most of them by hand. Okay? But if you're going to use pliers, and for a couple of the parts on here we're going to, that's what you want. Okay? You want these. They start off small, they get big, and it'll make a nice round bend. Chain nose pliers. Um, obviously they're designed for making chains, right? You know, like, like jewelry and stuff, but or electronics guys, we use, we use these all the, the time. At least the ones that know what they're doing. Okay. Um, like I said, this is going to be boring, but you're going to see the whole thing. We're not leaving anything out here, so feel free to fast forward. Have some IPA isopropyl alcohol. Um, please don't use rubbing alcohol. That's typically maybe 50% alcohol, maybe 70% alcohol. Awful lot of water in there. You want to get almost pure isopropyl alcohol. What I actually, I, I buy it by the gallon, of course. Buy big, big gallons of it. Great stuff. This actually does have uh, a little bit of water in it. Okay? This is not what's called anhydrous IPA. Anhydrous IPA truly has no water in it. Um, however, when you're distilling alcohol, I don't, I don't know if you've ever noticed, when you buy your, you know, 195 proof Graves Triple X, it's not 200 proof. You cannot get alcohol pure alcohol by simply distilling it. It will, it will always take a little bit of water with it. I believe um, 
the best you can get is maybe 96%, 97%, something like that. But you can get it purer through other means. So they sell something called anhydrous um, IPA, which, which goes through a further refining step, and you will truly get no, no water in it or just trace amounts. But this, but this stuff is fine. Um, just a general purpose IPA. That's what you want. We're gonna we're gonna use that to clean the clean parts. Uh, we are gonna clean all of our parts, and you're going to see why. Some people are gonna think, "Oh, John's being anal," but I'm not being anal. A lot of a lot of these parts are very are very very dirty, and um, aren't going to lead to good to good joints. And we want nothing but good joints. When products leave my leave leave my shop, uh, you know they go to guys playing in their in their bedroom. They go to guys playing bars a couple times a month, and they also go to touring, to touring pros. And um, yeah, I do have a lifetime warranty on my products, uh, but you know, what good does a lifetime warranty do if my stuff keeps on breaking on, on stage? When this stuff leaves my shop, I don't ever want to see it again. So we do everything we can, everything we possibly can to make sure that this lasts, hopefully, a lifetime. It should last a lifetime. That's what we want. Okay. Basic chem wipes. Again, don't use tissues. Um, uh, you could maybe use paper towels if you really wanted to. If you're really strapped for cash, and you can't afford a few a few bucks for chem for chem wipes, I suggest you buy chem wipes. Um, they're cheap. They work well. They're tough. Um, it's fun to say chem wipe, right? You can use paper towels. Do not use tissue. Tissue has all sorts of lotions and lanolin and crap in it. You know, yeah, you don't you don't want to want to introduce that. You want pure. Um, I think these these are delicate uh, delicate task wipes. So these are probably not paper. Um, I suspect this is uh, probably a cotton product or something or something like that. But anyhow. That's that's what you want to use, but if you have to use a paper towel, okay. <clears throat> For solder, the only solder that matters, at least in the U.S. and anywhere else where you're hand soldering and you don't have to worry about Rojas, is um, Kester number 44, Kester number 44 solder, okay. I happen to use uh, two different size oak. Oh, so it's Kester 40, 44, rosin. It's a rosin core solder, okay? I happen to use um, 31 sal, you know, 031, and a 25 thousandths, I believe. Let's check. Yeah. And a 25 south. So I have a smaller one, and I have, and I have a big, have a bigger one. I happen to have them in these, in these reels. Um, I go back and forth. Sometimes I just cut, just cut off a piece and use them by hand. This is a great way to do it, to do it too. Um, I just made, just make a little loop and feed, and feed it in. But if you're doing a lot of this stuff, uh, it's convenient to have them in reels. Uh, you, you can get these from. Um, the tool, I think. This happens to be a hack a hackle one. It's a dual hackle one, which is really convenient. If you're going to just buy one, um, and I tell you, I go back and forth. Sometimes I think I want the 25 sal if I'm only going to have one. Sometimes I think I want the 31 sal. Lately, my mood for the past few weeks is the 31 sal. And um, it, it, even, even, even for finer work. And it really has to do with... Um, at how how the flux works. You know, you introduce more flux into the joint with the 31 sal than the 20 than the 25 sal, and it just seems to work a, a little bit better. That said, I'm not sure what I'm going to do today. I'm just going to do what whatever um, my mood dic dictates. But uh, these days, for general work, if I were only going to have one, I would probably recommend buy 31. Okay, so buy Kester number 44. 31 south south 31 thousands and the actual mix is 6337 okay you'll see a lot of 6040 out there there's no reason for it that is an old mix every everybody changed over to 6337 eons ago it's what's called a eutectic um, 
eutectic mix. What that means, and, and that's just the um, combination of, of lead versus tin, 63% and, 30, and 37%. What that means is as it cools, it will go more or less directly from uh, liquid to solid. So it makes it actually pretty hard to get what, what we call a disturbed joint, where as it's cooling down, you wiggle it around, and then you get this awful looking joint that has no strength, it's not right, you know, you, you really need to need to redo the joint. You know, you can get that with 60-40, you can still probably get it with 63-37, uh, but it's a lot harder to get. That's the one you want, 60-40, that's from like the 40s, you know, 30s and 40s and stuff, okay? 63-37, uh, Kester number 44, industry standard for everything, everything having to do with hand soldering with a lead uh, mix, okay? That's what you want. Don't buy anything else. Unless you really want to. But don't say I didn't warn you. Okay. <clears throat> we don't really make very many mistakes here. I hope not to make any mistakes today, but every now and then you're going to have to Read to redo a joint or take take off some solder, do something like that. I use solder wick. The best solder wick I found found again is uh, Tech Spray. Uh, this Pro Wick stuff, really really great. Um, this particular size is number three. Good general purpose size. Really great stuff. Um, I also have a smaller size. I'm not sure what number this is. This is an NTE uh, elec electronics one. Not because um, I didn't like the Pro Wick, but this is just all they happen to have. Okay. But it, but it, but it, but it's fine too. This is a small, a smaller size. That's all. You can use solder suckers. I don't find them to be as convenient. Sometimes I will if I can't get a through hole clean. Um, I will come back and clean it with this. I'll heat it up from one side and suck it out the other side. I don't use this very much. The ideal solution would be to have an actual solder sucker, a real desoldering um, station, but they're very, very exp expensive, and if you're not doing a lot of rework, you really don't need it. Um, that said, I've used them. They're great. I don't have one currently in the shop. If I were going to buy one, I would probably buy a um, Hacko. Hacko makes great products, great world-class products. Okay, enough about that. For flux, and we are going to add a little bit of flux to um, a couple of these joints, and you'll understand why when we get there. For the number 44 solder, the proper flux is Kester number 186. That's all you want to use for, for flux. That's the proper rosin flux for this particular solder. Um, you can get it two-formed. You can get it in a pen, which I really don't like that much. The only other form you can get it in that I know of, at least, is gallons. And I just simply don't use enough to justify a um, gallon. Um, there are a cu couple of guys online that are selling little, little vials of it for absolutely ridiculous um, prices. Um, I would say just buy just buy the pen. It's not the most convenient way to apply it, but it, it's good enough. Okay? You want that. We're also going to use some tape. I'll show you why. I happen to have just a little bit of drafting tape here. Um, you could also use masking tape, of course. Um, you're going to see this is really conven con convenient. You know, you can search all day long on the internet and you will rarely see anybody using tape the way we're going to uh, use it on these boards. However, if you go into the industry, and I should let you know I was an engineer for uh, almost 20 years before um, I started my own, com own company and started doing, doing stuff like this. Um, in aerospace, um, a lot of a lot of pros use tape, but for some reason you never see it. 
You never see it in a video. You never see it written down any, any, anywhere. Uh, I'm going to show you how we're going to use this to make really great joints and uh, easy joints. Easy. Okay, what else do we have here? Ah, solder station. Let's zoom in on that. I've had this guy in my shop now maybe about a year. This is a JBC solder station. Station. It's not a soldering iron. Um, what you want. Okay, you know, I under I understand uh, you know not everybody has, you know, a hundred a hundred bucks or eighty bucks or three or four hundred bucks or however much it's gonna cost to get an actual solder station. All you can afford is a soldering iron. Okay. Lots of great joints have been made with soldering irons. Um, solder stations are actually temperature controlled. Um, there's closed loop temperature control in here. So when you apply the iron to the joint, um, it's actually going to pump as much heat as it needs to pump into the joint to maintain the temp temperature. Much different than a, just a soldering iron that you plug into the wall uh, that's just going to heat up to some ridiculous temper temperature. Uh, and then when you touch it to the work, it immediately starts to cool down. That's really not what you want to do. If that's what you have, you know, deal with it. Um, but I highly rec recommend that you buy some sort of solder station. This particular one is a JBC. They're made in Spain. My opinion, they probably make today the best solder station you, you can buy at any price. Um, and I've used them all. Uh, I think these are even better than, Met, than Metcal in terms of thermal reco recovery. Um, fantastic. Very expe expe expensive. Very expensive. Uh, at least compared compared to some others. I think this was maybe three or three or four or four hundred bucks or so. The tip the tips are a little bit, pri bit pricey too. We have a little um, brass cleaner here. Fantastic. I love this thing. Gets all the soldered globs off. Really, really great. And then, and then we also have a shocking sponge, which will um, help get some of uh, the ox oxidation off. Um, if I could only have one, well, you know, a sponge is cheap and the brass thing is cheap, so don't only have one. Have both. All right. Let's not even go there. For tips. Oh, one really nice nice thing about this um, station is how is how quickly you can change tips too. Okay. It's really great. Okay. For tips, for whatever reason, um, soldering irons and, and solder sta stations too always seem to come with those conical tips, uh, which is not the right kind of tip. Um, in my opinion, the conical tips are uh, pretty much useless. I've never found an actual use for one uh, for the work that we're doing here. And I think for 99% of the work that you're going to do, the proper tip is going to be a chisel tip. For most of the work I do here, I use that chisel tip. I think it's uh, about a two and a half millimeter tip, about probably about two and a half milli millimeter. Okay. For some of the heavier work I do, like on cables, I switch to this high thermal capacity. You can see how fat, how fat that is. High thermal capacity tip. Uh, it's a little bit bigger, um, maybe about three millimeters. I think this is about three, three millimeter or so. Okay, just a little bit bigger. And of course, it's the high thermal capacity tip. It's much fatter. Um, use that on cables. Sometimes I'll whip this out for the back, for the back of pots. Okay, so for today, everything we're going to do today, we're going to use that tip for the uh, entire thing. You want a chisel tip, and the reason that you want a chisel tip is that the conical tip really, really only hits in one in one spot. What we want to be able to do is put this whole flat right against the work and the pad or uh, whatever else we're, we're uh, soldering to and transfer a lot of heat really, really fast. We want to be on and off. We don't want to be playing around with the, the joint, okay? You don't want to play with the joint. You want to get on, you want to get off, okay? <clears throat> Some other things kicking around that I'll talk about when uh, we get to them, but that's the basic um, soldering setup right there, okay? 
I'll talk about strippers later. Wire strippers. <laughs> All right. Actually, have a thermal stripper here. We'll talk about that when we get to the wiring part. Okay. Let's get going. 